Over the years, television and movie audiences have been flooded with imitations of James Bond. In my opinion, the person who comes closest in real life is private investigator Jay Arms. And his achievement is even more impressive because Jay Arms has established himself as a world-famous detective despite the fact that he lost his hands in a freak accident at the age of 12. But he was determined not to let his handicap hold him back a self-made man arms has a network of investigators throughout the world. His client list has included such notables as Marlon Brando, Elvis Presley, Elizabeth Taylor, King Faisal, and other assorted heads of state and royalty. Besides a wild animal sanctuary on his eight and a half acre estate in El Paso, Texas, Arms keeps a fleet of cars, including a Rolls Royce, a Jaguar, and a Corvette all of them equipped with telephones, television sets, and whatever other special equipment a private eye on the go might need. <laughs> Unlike James Bond, Arms is a deeply religious man, contributing 10% of his yearly income to the Emanuel Baptist Church. But religion aside, Arms is in a business where self-defense and self-preservation are prime considerations in a person's mind and Jay is the first amputee in the world to be able to fire a pistol with just one hook. And just like all your basic investigator types, he has a black belt in judo, karate, and jiu-jitsu. But he goes beyond that with a mechanical device that would make the six million dollar man rusty from tears of envy. <laughs> Built into the right hook on his right arm is a 22 caliber magnum pistol. That's the regular pistol. Wait till you see the one that's built in. It's much more efficient than that one. And it's the only one of its kind in the whole world. Here it is, and as you see, it's triggered by a muscle in his forearm. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome J.J. Arms. Your, your, uh, your life is, is really so exciting. It's almost, you know, it's, it's a classic tale of, uh, of truth being more exciting or stranger than fiction. But the one thing that I'm really curious about is why you built that pistol right into your, your right hook. I mean, is that really necessary is my first question. And, and secondly, uh, does it really work? Now, all right, now I'm going to go a step further. <laughs> Let's assume that I'm... A, a crook or someone who's out to get you, and I understand there have been various assassination attempts on your life, and I have this pistol, and I'm pointing it at you right now. And I say, okay, Mr. J. Arms, because of you I spent 10 years in prison, and this is the last five seconds of your life. Four. Three. Just a minute, just a minute. I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to take your life. I'm a religious man. I'm a, I'm a religious man, and I just... Uh, I've lived it, I've read the book and seen the play, and... Oh, <laughs> Good night, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, well... I devised... <laughs> hello, hello. I devised this gun for self-preservation and also I had been I had been encountered with so many assassination attempts on my life I don't know you're always making someone mad when you're accomplishing your missions you know have people ever really shot at you you know trying to I've been shot um, three times um, one penetrated about half inch close to my heart and um, been shot in the leg been shot in the shoulder have you All ever, in the line of duty. Have you ever shot anybody back in the line of duty? Oh, yes. How many people? Many times. Now, you're a deeply religious person. Do you see any conflict between conflict. what you do and... Well, no. Uh, it's just the same as if you were in the war or if you were in the line of duty in, in law enforcement. 
even though you, you may be a religious person, you're, you're there to protect the life uh, of others and to protect your own life, too. This is kind of an awkward question, but your name is Arms. Uh, yes, is that your real name? It's, it's my real name. It's kind of ironic, you know. That's my real name. Uh, it's A-R-M-E-S. It's not A-R-M-S, but it's also known as Arms, A-R-M-S. How did you lose your hands, if you don't mind? At the age of 12, um, there was a, an 18-year-old boy that came over to my home, and he uh, brought over a box that contained railroad torpedoes, which is a dynamite camp. He asked me to open the box. I was 12 and he was 18, so I didn't know the seriousness of the contents of the box. I opened the box, and within this box, there was another container. So he asked me to open the container. I opened it and had a lead sealed on it. He asked me to take it off, which I did. When I took the lead sealed off, it exploded and completely blew me from the point of impact about 20 feet away. I landed by this uh, tree, and I remember very well, I was attempting to get up, you know, by trying to grasp the tree, and I looked at my hands, and they were all gone. They were 20 shreds. I want to talk about how you learned to use those hooks the way you do, about some of your famous clients, like Marlon Brando, you found his son Christian, and, well, just about you and, and what's ahead for you, J.J. Arms, when we come back. It's in one minute. <laughs> If my voice is trembling in this act, it's because I still haven't recovered from uh, my greeting with Mr. Arms. I knew approximately what he was going to do, I have to confess, but the whole time I was sitting here introducing him, I kept having this chill run through me that maybe he misplaced the blank cartridge for the 22 Magnum. And my, <laughs> I, I was going to be the first, the first host whose head was actually blown off on his own show. I, but we, we always joke about that because my life is threatened in some of the stories I do, and I, I always say to uh, to my producer, at least we'll get the last best story out of it. You know, this would have been great before millions of people having my head roll off the stage. But well, back there when I was when I was back there switching the bullets, uh, it, it came through my mind. Uh, <laughs> oh, great! I'm glad I'm glad you're telling me that now. <laughs> what? Uh, all right, here you are. You're you're 12 years old, and your your hands have been shredded in this horrible accident. Um, didn't that discourage you? I mean, didn't that uh, kind of put a damper on all your career plans. It wouldn't that turn you away from something as active and physical as as the business you've chosen? It's just not a natural progression. Well, right after right after the the accident, uh, boy, everything just looked dark. And for a few days, the uh, the walls were closing in. I was in the hospital for uh, supposed to have been for a six months period. That's what the doctors told me that I was going to be in. And uh, after the third day that I was in there, I was, getting, I was ready to get out. So uh, they were making all these plans for me that I was going to be fitted with prostheses at the end of six months, and I would have to go to a training center to learn to use the, the hooks, they kept calling them. And um, right then was when I made up my mind that I wasn't going to wait no six months. I advised my father that I didn't want the hooks that they, everybody's been talking about. I wanted them now. My arms were all, all swollen and all that, and all bandaged like footballs, you know. So uh, after the 22nd day in the hospital, we, my father and I talked the doctor into fitting me with uh, the artificial limbs, the prostheses, although it was against the doctor's will because he stated that it was uh, nonsense because every, about every week that I had the prostheses on that uh, my arms would shrink from the swelling. My father stated, well, that's what he wants. And that's what I, uh, I was out of the hospital after the 22nd day of being in the hospital and I went back to school. I continued my education and got out of uh, high school when I was 15 and continued my education and went on to college. I was so, so small, I was 15, I was going to college and I used to be called shorty, you know, all the big, Students with their that was dates. before you got the gun in your right That was right before hook. I got yeah. the gun, yes. <laughs> but uh, thereafter, I continued my studies, and uh, my goal had been to become a doctor, a surgeon, but uh, I was intelligent enough to realize that I didn't want my patients to die of fright when I was performing surgery. 
you know, so I had to change my career to law enforcement, which was uh, after I obtained a degree of criminolo in criminology. That was uh, the time that I did the research into the private investigative field. And got into it. And got into it. Well, let's talk about some of your famous cases, like uh, the one you retain. First of all, you live very lavishly, so obviously you're, you're pretty successful. I've read someplace that you command fees in the tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, but if you could just talk about the case that Marlon Brando retained you for, finding his son, how, what was the, the facts and how you went about getting him? Well, I, I was called from Paris uh, by Marlon Brando, and I was told that, uh, that Christian Brando had been kidnapped uh, due to the uh, release of The Godfather. And at this time, Marlon Brando was working on The uh, Last Tango in Paris. And uh, the Godfather had just been released, and all of a sudden, Christian Brando is, has disappeared. So I was told that he had uh, every law enforcement agency in the world, including Interpol, had put a net all over the whole country. And uh, still, Christian Brando had not been found three weeks. And uh, he said, Jay, I want you to get on the case, no matter what it takes. So I got into the case three days and three nights. Afterwards, I recovered Christian Brando, and it was uh, kind of humorous the way uh, everything came about. Um, after my leads led me to um, Mexico, and it was about uh, 396 miles off the coast of Mexicali, I was uh, piloting my uh, jet helicopter. It's a Hughes 500. I engaged five federal Mexican police to uh, familiarize me with the territory there. So uh, when I interviewed them, I uh, wanted them to go with me because it's a uh, Hughes 500 and occupies six passengers. So then um, one of the Mexican federal police said, no, he says, that puddle jumper, he says, I wouldn't trust it. He says, I've got nine kids and I can't, uh, I can't afford to, to get into it. And in the first, in the first uh, thought, came to his mind and says, there's this guy with two hooks. He says, he's going to pilot that, that uh, craft, you know. So the other, the other um, uh, Mexican federal police said, oh, no. He says, I, I get uh, uh, airsick by go getting into an elevator. Yeah, the third one said, he says, I can't even get, go into a second story. He <laughs> said, so one after the other, they all refused to go with me. So they said, well, we'll take it by ground, and we'll search by ground on a jeep and you search by air. So I did. So after three days and three nights without food and uh, a little water, I, uh, I, came across, I came across their camp. It was eight uh, hippie uh, individuals that had uh, made up a camp there. And uh, in the concaves of the ocean, they had tents and they had food and supplies there for months. So after I uh, located their camp. Uh, I identified one of the uh, cars that I was looking for. So I flew back to join the Jeep, and I advised them I landed, and I advised them that I had found the suspects that I had been looking for. And I said, I was very enthusiastic and really, really worked up. And I said, all right, can you come with me now? I said, no, no. He says, go down, go down there. He says, and we'll, we'll see you in a few hours and keep the place under surveillance. So I, I went back. I can't, after about four and a half hours of waiting for them, here they come, about putting along on a Jeep. And um, so they all whispering, and says, all right, this is your case now, so we'll, we'll cover you. I said, this is your territory. I said, oh, yeah, that, but this is your case. He said, we don't know if those gringos uh, there have kidnapped anybody or not. He says, but you go in there and you, we'll cover you. I said, fine. I was armed. And, um, Aren't you always? <laughs> <laughs> so then uh, I ran in there, and of course, thinking I had all this reinforcement behind me, all of them had big old 45s, you know. So I ran in there in the first tent, you know. I said, "Everybody out," you know. And sure enough, uh, there was a guy came out naked, you know. And I lined him up against the walls of the ocean there, and I said, "Don't move." And I ran into another tent, you know, and. Um, so before you know it, I, I had several people lined up against the walls of the ocean, and I turned around, and, and I see some heads looking over the bushes, and there was the federal police and my reinforcement. <laughs> <laughs> so
So then, uh, by this time, it was too late to, to go back and think twice. So finally, after the eighth individual, well, I told, I, I waved at these people that they could come out now, that I had everything under control. And uh, then I found the tent there that contained Christian Brando. Was he actually a prisoner? Uh, he was held against his will. And uh, he had a worse case of bronchitis than I do. I have laryngitis now. But uh, Christian Brando couldn't even breathe. If he had been there a day more, he would have died. I know we could talk about some of your exploits all evening. I know that you've started acting. You've, you've made the transition from reality to, to fiction now with a segment you did for Hawaii Five-0. Yes, sir. And we have a little clip from it. And let's, let's take a look at that now and uh, check out Jay and some of his other exploits, and then we'll talk some more about some of his own plans. I was a bad guy. But I understand you're going to be in a CBS series starring yourself in which you'll be the good guy. That's right. Uh, CBS has uh, negotiated a television series um, that they're writing now on known, uh, they're going to call it The Investigator, which I portray the toughest private eye in the world. I wonder why. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> um, I wish you continued success in your new career, you know, because you're a nice fellow and a good guy, basically, and also because I think you're an inspiration to, to handicap people, basically. And I was going to shake your hand, but I'm afraid it's going to discharge on no, you. No. <laughs> All right. Good luck to you. Thank you. Good night, America goes on the road when we come back. Thank you.